Well, Central, it is so good to be with you this morning, whether you're joining us in person or online. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful today to be in the house of the Lord. Are you thankful this morning? So as we stand to our feet, can we just worship and praise our Father this morning?
sin and death and the grave. So this morning, you don't need to be fearful. This morning, you don't need to be afraid. This morning, we can truly experience joy because we know that Jesus Christ overcame sin and death and the grave and Satan. So whatever it is this morning that you're going through, you can have victory in the name of Jesus Christ. Can we just sing this out?
this morning we serve a faithful God do you believe that this morning hey you may be seated good morning and welcome to Central man we are so glad that you made it here on this rainy Sunday morning if you're watching online welcome to Central we're so glad that you're joining us as well or streaming wherever you might be streaming from it's gonna be a great morning we're grateful that we get to be together that we get to worship together that we get to pray together we get to give together we get to be together man what a gift it is I love that we're able to come together on Sunday mornings and lift up the name of Jesus. We believe in this church that the name of Jesus holds power because Jesus didn't just die on a cross, but he rose from the grave, he defeated death. And because of that, we can trust in him and he can be our savior, our personal savior. And so if you're here this morning and you're brand new, man, we just want you to know straight out of the gate that we love Jesus in this church and we would love to meet you. So if you're new, welcome to Central. We love new families here. We wanna meet you after the service. One of the things that we love here is prayer. We believe when we pray, God listens. We believe when we pray, it's not just a thing that we are, we are supposed to do, it's something that God calls us to do. And so we're gonna take a few moments right now and pray for some of our friends and family that are going through difficulties in this room and people watching online. We're also just gonna just pray as a way of saying, thank you, Jesus, for what he's done for us. So if you could, let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. We thank you, God, for what the, we just sang, that great is your faithfulness. God, that you are who that you say that you are, that your word is true, that we can come to a church that lifts up your name and believes that you are the one that matters more than anything else, God. And so Lord, I just pray for, for my friends and family in this room right now, God, some of them are going through difficulties in their marriages. Some of them, Jesus, are going through difficulties in their jobs. So Lord, some of them are celebrating great milestones. Some of them are celebrating, are celebrating new life. God, we also know in the room this morning and people watching online, they're, they're also mourning the loss of people that they love. Lord, this morning we pray for the families of Ed Easter and Mary Ellen Y and many other families that are, that are here in this room that are just dealing with tragedy, sadness, disappointment, and loss. God, I pray just in this moment, Lord, this moment that we can just know that you are faithful in the good days, in the hard days, and that you're with us, God. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. And thank you, Jesus, that we can come and worship you, the living Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, at this time in our service, we turn our attention to giving, a moment where we press pause from worshiping through music, worshiping through prayer. And we talk about worshiping through giving. And I was just reminded of this verse this morning that I would love to read. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse seven. It's in the New Testament. It says this, you must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or out of response to peer pressure. I love this verse. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. When I was driving in this morning, I was just reminded of just how many cheerful givers we have in this place. It's an amazing opportunity that we get to be able to participate in giving. The gifts that we give, the, the things that God's given us, we're able to give back and say, thank you, God. And kind of share, we're, we're in fall. We're in fall, y'all. And because we're in fall, man, ministries are coming back, playlands coming back, groups are coming back, family ministries are coming back. There's so much that's coming back. And because of your generosity, because of your giving, we're able to see amazing things taking place right here in this church, people watching online and people around the world in our Water's Edge family. So thank you this morning, church family, for giving cheerfully. There's three ways to give on the screen behind me and right in front of you watching online. Hey, at this time, we're gonna turn our attention to the Bad Vice video. It's our very own Pastor Craig Reese is gonna be sharing. And then from there, one song. And then from there, our favorite Pastor Corey Castle, teaching pastor, we love you, bro. He's gonna be up in a few moments to teach. If you could turn your attention to the screen. The bad advice I was given was that a person can never really be free from the pain of their past. 
I finished seminary about six months prior to meeting up with a friend, a really good friend that I had in seminary. His name was Jan. We arranged to meet in West Wales. But a lot had happened to me since then. I'd gone on a mission trip that I'd led and then met my wife, uh, Vipke. We got engaged. So all of this had happened in that time since Jan and I had last met. So Jan and I met up and I was excited to meet him. I had so much to tell him. It was such a great time. And then I shared with him that I'd met this wonderful woman and we were engaged. And he said, tell me about her. So I started to tell Jan about Vipke, about how as a teen, she had battled with anorexia and depression, gone away to a treatment center for a long period of time. And as a result of that, had actually met Christ. And of course, for me, in that point, this was just such an incredible story. And in that moment, I remember Jan looking at me and going, stop, Craig, what have you done? She is basically never going to be free of this. You are have a call of God on your life. What are you doing? Do not marry her. My initial reaction was, oh no, because I really hadn't thought about this. And my faith was so simple in that moment that I thought if God had intervened so dramatically in someone's life, then of course this was going to be good moving forward. So in the simplicity and maybe even the naivety of faith, I hadn't even stopped to consider what if there is a, a shadow side to this that she will never be free of? What would happen to the call of God on my life, a call to ministry, what I believe was going to be a bright future. So that was my first reaction to this advice was, oh no, what if he's right? But then the second part of that was, hey, wait a minute, aren't we children of God? Don't we have a, a Bible that tells us stories of a God who breaks into people's lives, who heals, who delivers, who restores, who saves. And it's in that moment that I just recognized that while there was profound wisdom in what Jan may be saying, there was another side to this story that I believe to be even more true. So Vipka and I uh, got married in September. We'll have been married 28 years. And I'm so I'm thankful that there is so much uh, to celebrate there. But what happened in our story was for the first few years, early years of our marriage, there certainly was that other side of which Jan spoke. That side that basically was of a struggle to break free from the, the pain of the past and the hold that that had. And so in those early years, I certainly saw what it took for someone to break free. And I saw why Jan said what he said. But the other part of that, is the greater part of that, is how God does work to set people free, seeing how free Vipka is, but more than that, actually seeing the healing power that comes to other people, as Vipka and I have just been able to share the story of a God who really does set people free from the past and uses that pain and that brokenness in a very a very powerful way to bring hope and healing to the lives of other people. I'm Craig, and this is my story of bad advice.
just sing this out? Cause all my life you have been so, so good. Is that true in your life this morning? With every somebody around you and just share one way that you have seen the goodness of God in your life this week before everyone takes a seat. So share that story with someone around you. Good morning, Central. Everybody here in person, everybody watching online. Who's excited to be alive today? Anybody grateful? Hey. I love it. I love it. We've got some energy. This is the early morning crowd. If you're watching online, maybe you're not here in Southwest Michigan, maybe you're around the world. It's kind of a gloomy, rainy October day today, but I don't know about you. I'm just still grateful to be alive. I'm just grateful. Like the, when, when they said, turn to someone and tell them why you're grateful, what you're grateful for, for what God's doing. And I was like, I'm alive. And I don't know about you, some days it's just like, whoa, I'm alive. And um, I'm excited to be with you for part four of this series. If you're new, my name's Corey. I'm one of the pastors here. And I get to serve here at Central now as, a, as also I get to serve with a couple of our Water's Edge International Churches. But I'm gonna jump right into it today. The, the title of this series is called Bad Vice on the Count of Three. Everybody say Bad Vice, one, two, three. Bad. Now, Bad Vice is a made up word. It means bad advice. And uh, we've all followed bad, bad advice. And the tagline of this series, we've said over and over again, mistakes made, lessons learned, freedom found. So we're looking at some of our favorite biblical heroes, but instead of looking at their highlight reels, we're looking at their mistakes because true wisdom has often been said not having to learn from your own mistakes, but rather true wisdom is being able to learn from other people's and apply it to your life. So that's what we're trying to do. And we're laughing a little bit this series, at least. So I, actually, I kind of felt bad laughing at a baby elephant following there at the end. Paul, like, that was just sick. But no, I'm, just, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> but I felt really bad for it. And sometimes we can laugh at our bad advice, right? Sometimes we've, fought, we've all followed it and we can laugh at it. It's laughable later on. But I just want to start with, with a moment of sobriety in this. Like, the reason we're teaching this and the reason we're laughing at it is because many of us know how detrimental following bad advice can be in our lives. And today we're gonna to look at one of our all time favorite biblical heroes. I mean, in the hall of fame of faith, he's like top five, maybe even top three. If there was an all-star team of faith, this guy would probably be the power forward. He's so important that when Jesus was in his three years of ministry, um, Jesus met with like two dead guys a couple times. One of them was Elijah, another one was our boy named Mo. It was Moses. Like literally Moses was such a biblical hero that after he was deceased and Jesus was in his three years of ministry, dead Moses came and chatted it up with Jesus. He's a big deal. But how many of you know Moses made some big mistakes because he followed some bad advice? And, and like we know if you grew up in church, you speak Christianese, you know like Moses was a murderer. 
Um, so we don't think of him like that. We think of Moses, the great emancipator. We think of Moses, like the, the guy that led the nation of e Israel out of Egypt, out of captivity, out of slavery, crossed the Red Sea, received the Ten Commandments. I mean, Moses has a highlight reel, but did you know homeboy was a murderer? Like he made, but, but here's the crazy part. That wasn't Moses's biggest mistake. Did you know that? How many of you like murder would be about as big as it's gotten for you, right? You're like, pray. That's why the Bible sometimes is therapeutic to read. Because look at all that God did through Moses. And he was a murderer. I mean, many of us could walk in today and we're like, well, I ain't killed nobody, thank God. Like, maybe God can still use me. But today we're gonna look at Moses' biggest mistake. It's actually the mistake that kept Moses out of the promised land. And murder didn't keep Moses from the promised land. It was this simple nuance that I wanna dig into today. But, but the reason I kind of preface the whole talk with this is because this seems like such a little piece of bad advice that Moses followed, but yet it kept him from God's biggest promise, this side of eternity. And that's why we're talking about this because yes, there's like bad advice, like, hey, don't speed. Like I talked about a few weeks ago and then you get a ticket and it's like, oh no, you know how to find. There's bad advice, like, oh, don't date them. You know, they're cute. That's all that matters. And you're like, oh, character matters, not cuteness. Uh, that's a word for some of you. Some of you can leave right now. That's the word you needed. But like, <laughs> sometimes that bad advice can be laughable, but sometimes following bad advice can keep us from God's promises. And so this is an important topic we're covering. And so if you have a Bible, open it up. We're going to be in two primary passages, Exodus chapter 17 and Numbers chapter 20. Exodus chapter 17 and Numbers chapter 20. Exodus chapter what? And Numbers chapter what? Good job, guys. I, that was nice. It, it sounded begrudgingly, but it, it's, it was still there. 17, 20. And while you turn there, I, I just want to point one more thing out. Like today we're going to talk about an, an object lesson. God often taught us principles of the kingdom of heaven using objects, like object lessons. Jesus would do this all the time. Like Jesus, one of my favorite object lessons of Jesus, Jesus holds up a, a pen or he talks about a pen, he, 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 a needle, like a sewing needle. And Jesus in the book of Matthew, he actually says it in three out of the four gospels, but in the book of Matthew, and Jesus talks about a needle and he says this in this object lesson, he said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a sewing needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. I'm gonna repeat that, because that's just crazy. He said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich or wealthy person to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And what's funny about the object lessons of Jesus and the object lessons of God is often like, what's funny is like when you research this, when you Google it, there's like all these different theories. Like people are like, well, I don't think Jesus actually meant like a sewing needle and a camel because that would be ridiculous. And a lot of theologians have surmised that, oh, there was this hidden secret gate in Israel and to enter the kingdom in this little secret gate for a camel to go through the eye of the needle, which was the name of the secret gate. It would have to strip off everything on it and kneel down and walk through symbolic. Here's the deal. There's no proof that gate existed. <laughs> Oftentimes preachers can make up a lot of stuff to, <laughs> to get across some principles that are good, but maybe not biblical. But that, that gate, no one has proof that it existed. Other people, other theologians would say, well, well, maybe the word for camel was wrong. Maybe it was camellio, which means something entirely different. Or perhaps maybe we're getting too caught up in the object and we're missing the lesson. Often Jesus spoke sarcastically or using the, the tool of hyperbole. And he was legitimately saying, most theologians would agree, he was saying, it is easier for a grown camel, the biggest animal in Israel, to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to get into heaven. Now, when he says that, everybody should go, that's ridiculous. A camel could never go through here. And that was Jesus' point. And we hear that and we're like, yeah, you rich people. <laughs> you rich people, it must be hard for you. I wanna let you know, if you're in North America, if you have more than one outfit, if you came here on a car on paved roads, if you have an iPhone or a flat screen television, he was talking to you. He was talking to me. He was saying it's easier to shove a camel through this than it is for us to get to God. In other words, it's impossible without the right person. It's impossible without the righteousness. So Jesus would often teach with these object lessons and all throughout the Old Testament, I don't know if you know this, like the nation of Israel is an object lesson. God over and over again, and it wasn't just needles with Jesus, like often in the Old Testament, God would use the object lesson of a staff. I told you we're talking about our boy Mo today. Moses was famous for his staff, right? And 
the book of Exodus chapter 17, we pick up on an object lesson dealing with Moses and his staff. If you're ready, say yeah. yeah. Awesome. Like 60% of you. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. Here we go. It reads, therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. If you've read like the book of Exodus and stuff that when it says the people quarreled, that's like a broken record. We'll get to that in a second. It says, therefore, the people quarreled with Moses. They started complaining to Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with these people? Anybody that's ever led a company or led a family or led a small group or led a ministry, we've all had that prayer, right? God, what do I do with them? God, please help me. They're insane. What are, anyways, I'm just venting. It's like therapy up here for me. Appreciate you guys. He says, what shall I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. They're about to kill me, God. And the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff. Everybody say the staff on the count of three. One, two, three. So take in your hand the good old faithful object lesson, the good old faithful staff, your tool of the trade that I have done so many miracles through. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Arab and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Masa and Merabah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now, right there in that first passage of Exodus chapter 17, we see so much Bad advice and so much good advice. So many godly kingdom principles that we could glean from, but I'm just going to point out a few before we get to the resolution in this object lesson. The first thing we see there is it says the people had a problem and the people brought their problem to Moses. I'm just going to jump in. This is kind of like the sermon before the sermon, not the main topic. But bad advice number one, bad advice number one, I wrote down, my problem is my leader's responsibility. Ooh. If you're watching online, no one amen that. It got real quiet in here. A lot of crossed arms. I'm just kidding, you're probably cold. But, but, but bad advice right here. My problem is my leader's responsibility. How many of you know this is bad advice? Like whether it's in the workplace or in ministry, I'll just, I'll just speak to what I know. I've been in ministry now for almost two decades, which is crazy to say. Some of you are like, how old are you? Did you start when you were three? I was four. And, um, and one of my favorite things in church is often in church and before I was a, a leader in ministry, like this was me. Often in church, we do this. My, my problem is my leader's responsibility. People will come up in church all the time and here's what they'll do. They'll go, hey, pastor, you know what we should do? You know what they mean when they say that? Hey, pastor, you know what you should do? That's what they mean. Hey, they, they'll go, hey, I noticed we have a problem. I noticed this in the parking lot. I noticed this in the kids' ministry. Hey, you know what we should do? And you know what, they, what we are really good at at the workplace and ministry and our families? We're really good at pointing out and having problems. We're really good at having problems. And that's what the nation of Israel did. They said, Moses, we have a problem. Bad advice, think and act like your problem is your leader's responsibility. One of my favorite things in ministry when somebody comes up to me with one of those, you know what we should do ideas? Hey, you know what we should do? We should start this ministry and there's these homeless people here and I really wanna help them or there's this da da da. And what I'll do is I'll sit there and listen and I'll get real excited and I'll go, ah, oh, that sounds awesome. Let me know what you need. Because the role of your pastor is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The role of a pastor is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The role of the saints, that's us, is to do the ministry. Amen. This side, that was strong. This side, amen? <laughs> All right, cool. I know who I'm preaching to on this first point, right? No, like, no, bad advice number one, my problem is my leader. And we do this in our workplace. We do this in ministry. We do this in just politics and government. My, it's the government's issue to fix. The government would, have, would not have to do half of what it, we're asking it to do if the church would step up. All right, thank you. This side, that was good. This is cool. I'm learning the dynamics of the room. But there's so many places in life where we abdicate our responsibility and we put it on our leader. So if bad advice is my problem is my leader's responsibility, good advice, good advice, I wrote it like this in my notes, take responsibility for your problem. 
But I wanna take it a step further. I wrote this down, great advice. Don't just see a problem, be the solution. Don't just see a problem, be a solution. At, at one of our churches down in Jamaica, the one I get to lead, Zeal, one of our principals in our leadership team is I am the solution. On the count of threes, everybody say, I am the solution. One, two, three. If you see a problem, God may have gifted you with the sight to see that problem so that you can be, this is a fun prop. I'm like, you, I see why Moses can you can be the solution, right? You can be, imagine in this story, if the nation of Israel would have ran up to Moses and be like, hey, Mo, I know you're tired and you're busy and you're doing a great job. Like, this is crazy. You got us out of Egypt. Here's the deal. We identified a problem, lack of water. We're all going to die soon from thirst. But here's what we've done. We've circled up the elders and the leaders. We've started three different prayer groups 24 seven. They are, they are petitioning God to bring us water or bring us the answer, so we're praying. We've also sent out five search parties in the local area to see if we can find a well or some type of reservoir or, or oasis. And then finally, we have a group of people coming together and we're just seeking your wisdom, Moses, on what you want us to do next. So we feel like we're doing all we can do. We're looking for the solutions. We just wanted to bring you the update and ask if there's anything we should do more or should stop doing. Could you imagine how the story would have went if that's the way the nation of Israel would have responded? Can you imagine the way your workplace, like the amount of promotions that would come your way if every time you saw a problem at work, you came to your boss with three solutions for the problem? Can you imagine what the church would look like and Water's Edge would look like if we continued to wear the solution hat and said, God, you show us the problem, we will be the solution. You sent us here, not just to point out the light, but to be the light. So bad advice, number one, my, prob my problem is my leader's responsibility. Good advice would be take responsibility for your problem. Great advice would be don't just see a problem, be the solution. Everybody say, I'm the solution one more time. One, two, three. Oh, I hope we mean it. The second piece of bad advice, just in this top narrative, this is a success story, by the way. This is a success story. Like God worked a miracle, but even in the miracle, there were mess ups and mistakes. It, the second piece of bad advice I wrote down here in this first narrative is bad advice number two, bad advice number two, test God. It said Moses named the place what he named it because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? You know what's really bad advice to test God? Some of us are like, I don't test God. What are you talking about? Like Old Testament example, there was a man of God that wanted God to answer him. And he said, all right, God, if this is really your will, he laid out a, a linen cloth, he laid out a fleece and he said, look, May the fleece be dry and everything around it be dewy and wet in the morning if it's really your will. And God did it. The fleece was dry and everything else was wet. And then he said, all right, God, I'm still not sure if it's you. So I'm going to put the fleece back out and make the fleece wet and all the ground dry. And if that happens, then it's your will. And it happened. But then after that, God said, don't you dare ever lay a fleece before me again. God said, do not lay a fleece before me again. In other words, who are you to test me? And we hear that and we hear this and we're like, we don't test God. Can I put it in like modern day terms for us? God, if you get me out of this ticket, I will never not tithe. God, if you save my marriage right now, we will be in small group for the rest of our lives. I don't know why I plea there, but like, you know, like in our prayers, we all like, we, we, here's, it's these negotiation prayers. God, if you, then I will. God, if you, then I will. That's testing God. Real faith. Real maturity is what we'll talk about in a couple weeks where it's God, if you do praise you and if you don't, even if you don't, I will still praise you. Ooh, could you imagine if the nation of Israel was like, hey, Moses, we're all about to die. We're running out of water, but we just want to tell you God is good and we're grateful he brought us this far. Again, an entirely different mindset. And this is a miracle in which God worked and did what he was supposed to do. And even in the miracle, we find mistakes. Even in the miracles, we find bad advice. But now fast forward. Again, we're getting to the biggest mistake Omo ever made. Remember the staff, remember the object lesson. This is the mistake that kept Moses out of the promised land. It wasn't murder, it wasn't slander, wasn't even the nation of Israel wanting to worship a golden calf and all that stuff. This was the mistake, the biggest mistake of Moses' life. 
In Numbers chapter 20, this is 40, almost 40 years later. So the nation of Israel gets out in the desert and they're like, hey, yay, we're free. And then they're running out of water and they're like, oh God, have you forgotten us? And Moses is like, no. And he takes his staff and he strikes the rock and out of the rock comes for, brings forth water. Side note, like often what God tells us to do makes zero sense. I tell people very often, if you've prayed and God told you something that makes no sense, that's probably God. Because imagine if you came to me today and you were like, hey, Pastor Corey, I'm thirsty. And I was like, hold on, hold this. And I came up to this speaker and I was just like, ha, and water gushed out. You would be like, this is insane. That's what God did. He went up to a rock and he just struck it and water came out. And for 40 years, it doesn't say this explicitly, but most theologians agree for 40 years, that's how they got their water in the desert. That rock kept providing water when they needed it. They would travel with it. And he struck it that one time and then water came out. But in Numbers chapter 20, There's no water again. And it reads almost 40 years later. Now there was no water for the congregation and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. See the difference there? Now there's two leaders. That's a great leadership takeaway. If you're doing it alone, you're doing it wrong. Moses over the course of the 40 years had raised up co-leaders with him and his brother-in-law Aaron and Joshua and he was training them to pass the baton of leadership too. And here at the end of the 40 years, at the end of the journey, almost into the promised land, we see it's not just Mo that the people are looking at, but they're looking at Moses and Aaron as the leaders. That's a great takeaway. If you're leading a small group, who's your co-leader? If you're leading a family, who are you leading it with? If you're leading a ministry, if you're the guest services leader, do it with somebody. We're supposed to be replicating ourselves. We're supposed to be making disciples. If no one's following you, you're not a leader. If no one's following you, you're not making disciples. Who are you doing life with? If you're doing it alone, you're doing it wrong. Some of you are like, can we be positive? This is hard. Okay. So it says, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and Aaron and the people quarreled with Moses again, complaining and said, would that we had perished with our brothers and sisters perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? So dramatic. They're bringing the animals into it. Both we and our cattle. And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. They started to pray to God and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the staff, object lesson, take the staff. He said, take the staff in a similar congregation and you, Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So so you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the people. As as the Lord had commanded him, then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and he said to them, now hear this, hear now you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and the staff and he struck the rock with his staff twice and water came out abundantly and the congregation drank and their livestock. Miracle achieved, problem solved, solution granted. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I've given them. What? Did anybody else read your Bible and you're like, hold on. Like, does anybody just get that immediately? After all that Moses had done wrong, what did he do wrong here that was so bad that after 40 years preparing to go and emancipate God's people, then emancipating God's people out of slavery, working miracle after miracle, parting the Red Sea, receiving the Ten Commandments. I mean, Moses was the man after all of those ups and downs and then 40 more years in the wilderness. This one episode kept him from God's promised land. And did you catch the nuance? Did you catch the difference? See, the title of my message today is, and I'm going to say it my Southern version, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Anybody ever heard that before? Some of you are like, that was all the intro? Yes, it's going to be a three hour. No, don't worry. The title of my message, the bad advice I have for you today is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. In Jamaica, they would say, if it not broke, don't fix it. If it ain't, I'll say it properly for you English teachers. If it is not broken... Do not fix it. In other words, if it's working, don't mess with it. How many of you have heard that before, right? How many of you have 
been given that advice before? How many of you have given that advice? Now, let me be clear. That can be good advice. There are times in life where when something's working, man, don't mess with it. But in this story, the bad advice Moses followed that kept him from the promised land, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Because did you catch the nuance? Did you catch the difference in the narratives? In Exodus chapter 17, then we need water. God says, take your staff, strike the rock. Then in Numbers chapter 20, we need water. God says, take your staff and speak to the rock. And what did Moses do? It said in his anger with the people, he looked at the people and said, shall we bring water from this rock for you? We is in me and Aaron, not God. And then he took his trusted tool. He took what worked all the time. He took, he took the tool of God and he struck the rock again. And here's the crazy part, Central. It worked. It said water came forth. You know the scariest part of this story? Is it worked. You know what that tells us? Just because something's working doesn't mean it's God's will. I'm just gonna let that sit. Just because something's working doesn't mean it's God's will. That's a crazy thought. Because why did God punish him? Because he disobeyed. God said, speak to the rock. He didn't say strike the rock. Now, some of you are like, oh my goodness. God is, is that like, and like, what? If I just get one word wrong, he's gonna keep me from all his promises? No, 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 you're missing, we're missing the greater point here. See, again, all of the Old Testament is object lesson after object lesson pointing to Jesus. I, this is why we read the Old Testament because the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. And so when God told Moses, hey, the nation of Israel is thirsty, I want you to take your staff and strike the rock. That was a metaphor, a picture of the savior who was to come in. What did Jesus say over and over again? Jesus said, I am living water. Drink of me and you will never thirst again. I will keep providing. So in the first moment when God told Moses, strike the rock, what he was saying is the rock of your salvation, my son Jesus will come and he must be struck down for your sin. But when God is struck down, when Jesus is struck for your sin, the springs of living water will come forth. And so fast forward, they're thirsty again. And God says, Moses, Moses, all you have to do is speak. The rock has already been struck. But when Moses struck it again, he messed up the object lesson because it inferred that the future rock of our salvation would have to be struck again and again and again every time we sin. Every time you mess up, it was as if saying Jesus must be crucified again. The, the rock must be broken again. Jesus must be taken down again. And God is like, no, 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 no. Once my son, once the rock of your salvation, once the rock has been struck, once, if you ever need of him again, all you must do is ask because he's already been struck. See, this is why it was a big deal because Moses messed up the object lesson that God was trying to show us generations later. Now, what's cool about God is what the enemy meant for evil, God can use for good. He actually turned it into an even greater object lesson in that Moses who represented the law couldn't enter the promised land, but Joshua, Yeshua, the name of Jesus did get to go to the promised land. In other words, the law doesn't bring us to God's promises, rather Jesus does. Come on, yes sir, I like that, right? But if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, now that's bad advice. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And we hear that and we're like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool, Corey. But we do this all the time. Sorry, I'm really hyped about this. Like over and over again in life, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is what I mean. We hold on to tradition. Can I just go there, Central? Like I'm new. If y'all don't like me, I'm probably still in my 90 day period. Y'all can get rid of me, but... <laughs> just vote. I'm just kidding. Every time God's people voted, it always ended in the bad decision. Did y'all know like the kingdom of God isn't a democracy? Oh, that's a side note. Just read the Old Testament. It's crazy. Every time Israel, which is allegorically the church, every time they voted, they voted wrong. God usually speaks to a leader and then speaks his vision. That's crazy. Side note. I'm not saying we shouldn't vote. Anyways, that's a whole other sermon. But <laughs> don't vote me out. Um, but we hold on to tradition all the time. This is what I mean. If it worked before, it'll work again. 
God, I hear you, but this is what I know works. So I'm going to use the tool instead of rely on the tool giver. We do this so much. Like we, I'll just go there, like in church world. I remember I grew up and, and my youth group, we experienced like a little revival and like God was moving and, and like things were happening and, and, you know, the band was a little bit louder and stuff like that. And like all of a sudden the pastor saw that the youth ministry was growing and we were like, yeah, look what God's doing. And he's like, man, we need to capitalize on this. You know what we need to do? A tent revival. Anybody remember tent revivals? We not old enough. Thank you. Four of us. I appreciate you. He's like, we need to do a tent revival. And the whole youth group was like, what? What are you talking about? And he's like, you know, we rent a big tent and we bring in an evangelist and we bring in the choir and we bring in the orchestra. And we were like, are you trying to kill this youth group? Like what? He was like, but it worked in the seventies and it worked in the eighties and it worked in the nineties. And I was like, we were like, but bro, it's 2000. It's getting quiet in here. Cause some of us are like, whoa, I think I get what you're, I think I'm smelling what you're stepping in, Corey. <laughs> like y'all know when, when they first brought an organ into the church, it split churches. People were like, no, we can't have instruments in church. Instruments are the devil. Get that devil organ out of here. And literally churches split over the organ. And then you should have saw churches when they brought in a piano. But you know, churches split when they took out an organ. Like the church split when they brought in an organ. Then when some churches tried to remove the organ, people were like, you can't have church without an organ. And we're like, do you, do you read your Bibles? <laughs> right? And then we're like, this is so fun. Then they brought in pews to some churches and they were like that modern technology, these benches, people need to be able to sit on the ground. And people left churches when they brought pews in. And I know you, none of you are like this, but do you know people have left churches because they took out the pews? Like, y'all know that's not a prerequisite for church, right? I'm just going to get all up in your chili today. Can we just do it? Can we do it? Like, it's so funny when we hold on to tradition because we're like, this is what worked. This is my staff. God, I've seen you move and work. And here's the deal. I'm not anti-pew. I'm not anti-organ. I actually, I told you, I grew up Southern Baptist. I love a good old hymn and stuff like that. Amen. Let's go. But how many, how many of you know we can focus on the hymn and miss him? We can focus on the seat and miss the one we're seated for. We can, like, it's so many. I, I remember I was talking with a, a church. Again, I'll just go there. I don't even know if I have the time to do it, but I'll do it anyway. I remember I was talking to a church and I was telling them about things that they're holding on to that could actually be keeping God's people or the people that need God from them. And uh, it was funny, again, this isn't an indictment on anybody, but how many of you remember like back in like small church, like when all the kids would come to the front and sing a song and then be dismissed? How many of you missed that? I missed that, that was so sweet. I missed that until I realized how awful that was for a first time guest. Imagine if you come to a church this size and it's your first time and you bring your kids in with you and about halfway through the service, they're like, hey, send your kid that doesn't know this song to the front of the stage with a bunch of kids that kid doesn't know. And then we're gonna escort your kid off out of your sight and bring them where you have no idea where we're taking them or what we're gonna do with them. If you're a guest, you're like, no. Absolutely not. I don't know who you people are. I don't trust you. And that's going to make my kid feel uncomfortable. Unintentionally, by holding on to tradition, you alienate first-time guests, the very people you're trying to reach. You see what I'm talking about there? And that's like a small, funny example. But there's so often times where we hold on to the tool and we forget the one that gave us the tool. See, the bad advice here is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The good advice, as generic as it sounds, I wrote down, is listen to the Lord. Listen to God. Listen, Linda, right? Listen. So real quick, I'm gonna run it down. How do you listen to God? Three easy steps. Pray, read, and listen. Pray, read, and listen. How do you hear from God? Pray, pray. Are you talking with God? Now, I used a word intentionally there. Are you talking with God? For many of us, prayer is when we talk to God because we need something. We're just like the nation of Israel. God, I'm thirsty. God, I'm broke. God, I'm lonely. Help! Those are great prayers. But what if the nation of Israel cried out to God as passionately when they didn't need something? 
What if the nation of Israel were like, God, we're grateful. God, this is awesome. God, thank you that we're not slaves. Thanks for your help. What if our prayer life wasn't contingent on the ups and downs, but rather our prayer life was about steady communication where we talk to God, but hear this, and then we let God talk to us. I put it in there twice, pray, so talk with God, read. One of the number one ways you will hear from God is by reading his word. That's one of the number one ways he speaks to us. He'll put that verse in your mind, oh, that's for me. But then I said, pray, read, listen. How many of us in our prayer times go, okay, 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 God. I've listed all the things I need. I've prayed for all the people. I've praised you. Now I'm just gonna take five minutes. My phone's off and away. And I'm just gonna listen. Some of us don't even know what that's like. Just listen to the Lord. How many of our prayer times consist of minutes and moments where we're not tossing questions or reservations or, or ideals toward God, but rather we're just, hey, I'm here. Yeah, God, this is what I've been doing. This is what I feel like you told me to do, but I just wanna let you know, I'm listening. I'm open. And isn't it funny how the nation of Israel it always took a really dark season to get their attention. Oh, we're starving, we need God. Oh, we're running out of food, we need God. Oh, we're thirsty, we need God. Again, what if we didn't just cry out to God in the dark seasons in the valley, but what if we talked with him as much on the mountaintops? You wanna know some great advice for your life? Just walk and talk with God at all times. But it's interesting how the nation of Israel is allegorical, it is an object lesson for us, for the church today. And often God has to take humanity, has to take the world through some of the darkest seasons to get our attention. Like I even think about like what we're going through right now as a, as a country, as a nation, as a world, like we're still in this pandemic season. How many of you would agree this is a really dark time for humanity? But here, here's my, I'm just gonna, can I, I'm gonna fly up 30,000 feet to end this real quick. I'm gonna get real ethereal for you big theological philosopher thinkers. Everybody else, just give me 10 minutes and then we'll wrap up. I truly believe we're on the verge of a second Renaissance. I, I really believe we are. Some of you are like, what, Renaissance? Isn't that like that weird painting face? No, 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 here's what I mean. There was a time in culture where art boomed, where culture and science and technology boomed and it was called the Renaissance. But do you know what happened right before the Renaissance? I wanna make sure I get it right here, but I wrote it in my notes. The first Renaissance was started in 1350 AD, but in 1346 to 1353, you know what the world went through? The bubonic plague, the black death. You know how many people died in the bubonic plague? They say at a low estimate, 70 million. Higher, more accurate estimate, 200 million humans died in a matter of three to five years from a pandemic. You know, COVID has killed almost 4 million people. 200 million humans died in a matter of four to five years. And out of one of the darkest seasons in humanity's history came one of the brightest cultural revelations we've ever seen. Art, Bert, this is where we get Michelangelo. This is where we get Raphael. This is where we get Da Vinci. This is where we get the Sistine Chapel. It's when science and technology, because everybody was closed into their homes, people started thinking, oh, should we do it the way it's always been done or should we do something different? And all of a sudden out of the darkest season, a burst of light came forth. But you know what came out of the Renaissance? What came out of the Renaissance was the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation was when the church decided the way we've always been doing it isn't working. And God, we see that you're doing something new. So the church started partnering with artists. The church started partnering with science. The church started partnering and influencing culture. And if you are Wesleyan, if you are Baptist, if you are Methodist, you can trace your faith lineage all the way back to the Protestant Reformation, which started because of the Renaissance, which came about because of the bubonic plague. We are in a dark season. But what if the darkness is exactly how God's trying to get our attention? What if the darkness is how God's trying to get our attention? It takes me back to this little needle. 
1995, there was a, a scientist named Robert Williams, and he was the president of the Hubble Space Telescope Foundation. Again, I'm a dork, I'm a science and history nerd. Forgive me if that's not you, but in 95, like shortly before that, we, we put the Hubble Space Telescope in the sky. And the whole point of the Hubble Space Telescope was to point at stars, was to point at the light and take a photo of that light. But Robert Williams had an idea. And his idea was, what if we take that telescope that was built for pointing at the light, and what if we point it at the darkness? And scientists tell us by doing this, it would be as if holding a needle up to the sky and looking through the eye of the needle, that's the amount of space we would examine if we did that. And he petitioned and he petitioned and the scientific community said, that's not what it was built for. That's not the tool that we have. It was built to look at the light, not at the darkness. But he begged and petitioned and he begged and petitioned and finally they gave him a little off time. And for 10 days, they pointed the telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope at one of the darkest parts of the sky just to see what would happen if they looked at the darkness. And what came back was an image that changed the scientific community, astronomy and humanity forever. It's by pointing it not at the light, but at the darkness, it revealed what is now called the Hubble Deep Field Space Image. And we didn't just see a star or stars. We saw thousands upon thousands of galaxies, all in the space of the eye of a needle. And it showed us that the universe is far greater than we could have ever imagined. And I'll take it a step further and say it showed us that our God is far bigger than we could have ever thought. Central, I'll just leave you with this. What if this week, instead of doing what's always been done, instead of eating where you always eat, instead of handling conflict the way you always handle it, instead of always doing what you've always done, what if just today we stop and pray, hey God, here's what I feel like I'm supposed to do, but I'm listening. And I know it may be working, but God, what if, what if you're trying to do something greater? I would even say, guys, as a ministry, what if, what if we opened ourselves up to saying, hey God, what if instead of pointing at the light, instead of pointing at the healthy, instead of pointing at the Christians in our community, what if we took our entire strategy? What if we took all of our funding? What if we took everything we could and yes, built up the saints and discipled the disciples, but we took our perspective and we pointed it at the dark, darkness. And we pointed at the darkest parts of our city, at the darkest part of our country. What light could we find in the darkness? What if we did something different? because I'm tired of holding on to the tool and not the tool giver. I'm tired of seeing people hold on to the way and not the way maker. I'm tired of seeing people run to the staff and not the savior. I'm tired of seeing people run to the rock and not the rock of our salvation. I'm tired of hearing people cry out for water and not the water that never leaves you thirsty again. I'm tired of seeing people get caught up in the location on earth and rather not the destination in heaven. Central, what if? Just this week. Maybe this year, what if we said, thank you for the staff, but God, we recognize it's never been about the staff. It's never been about the building. It's never been about the seat. It's never been about the song style. It's always been about listening to you and bringing the light into the darkness. And when we do that, all glory, all glory, all glory, doesn't go to a stick, doesn't go to a rock, but when we listen and obey, all glory goes to God. Father, thank you that you do get the glory. And thank you that no matter we, what we go through, God, you are speaking. And right now I just pray for anyone under the sound of my voice watching online there in 909 here at Central. God, that you would open our ears to you. Maybe some have never heard from you, God. May this be the week that we stop and listen. God, I pray that you would reveal to us those things in life that we've been holding on to that you maybe are calling us to let go of and do something different. God, I pray that you would show us where we maybe need to point towards the darkness 
and watch you light it up. But God, I just thank you that as we listen to you, you get the glory. And as 909 transitions and Pastor Larry takes it here, God, we pray that as we sing this last song to you, that it would put a smile on your face. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. stand to our feet as we sing this final song. To him who in the garden prayed, not my will but thine display, who there with perfect love obey, to him be all the glory. To him who ought no defense, I was gone and flesh was scourged by men, whose stripes no heal, restore, and man. To him be all the glory.
to connect with you, especially if you are new. Would you meet us out in the lobby? You'll find some tables and some friendly faces who would love to greet you and give you a gift. Next week is our very last week of the Bad Vice series, and we hope that you will join us for that. And um, God bless you as you step into this week. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday.